cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries. Alabama. Attorneys, proudly sponsored by Hollis Wright and Couch, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the Hollis Wright and Couch Law Firm and host David Lamb. Hello and welcome into the attorney. It's going to be a fascinating half hour tonight, so we really appreciate you joining us for the next half hour. Uh, our topic of conversation, uh, it's kind of a history lesson. It's, we're going to talk about elected officials, how it's done, uh, but also learn about the, some details from a fascinating guest tonight. But as always, you are invited to be a part of this conversation. It's for you. You could call, text, email, however is the easiest way for you to get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. Leading our conversation from the firm of Hollis Wright and Couch is Mallory Schneider. Mallory, good to see you. Good to see you as always, David. It's going to be a fun night, isn't it's it? It's going to be such a fun night yeah. because we have a very, very <laughs> special oh, guest nice. with us tonight. You are very special. <laughs> Former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, Sue Bell Cobb. She was Chief Justice from 2007 till 2011, and before that, she served on the Alabama Criminal Court of Appeals. And so we're very lucky and honored to have you here to talk about the election process. And now her credentials go way past what I just told you. That's just a yeah. sprinkle on the resume for you. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind, just fill us in a little bit about how you became Chief Justice and beyond. Well, Mallory, um, David, it's so nice to be here. It really is. Um, I, I actually became a judge November the 5th, 1981. Probably a lot of your listeners, folks that actually stay up this late <laughs> night, uh, weren't even born then. Uh, but I became the first, um, the youngest judge in the state of Alabama at the age of 25. Governor Fob James appointed me to a vacancy that had been uh, in the Conecuh County District Court bench for four years. Um, the Alabama's court system had been unified uh, by the genius of Senator Howell, for, former Chief Justice and uh, U.S. Senator Howell Heflin. And I was able to get that appointment. And then I had to run immediately thereafter. So I have a lot of stories that I'm known for throughout the state of mm -hmm. dogs that ran after me and, <laughs> and uh, various and sundry things and dog bites. I guess D-A-W-G, dog bites. And, oh, um, but I ran and, and won. And then I ran again in, in um, 1988 for another six year term. That was an interesting race. My father driving the pickup truck, you know, going down the, the <laughs> dirt roads um, because you know, there was no major media in Conecuh County. Right. You know, it was your little yard signs and some ads in the Evergreen Current, our only newspaper at the time. But then, I, after 13 and a half years, and one of the things I'm most proud of is that during that 13 and a half years, I tried cases. I was appointed by whoever the Chief Justice was at the time in um, over 40 counties, serving as circuit district and one time even probate judge of Lowndes County. And so I got a, such great experience uh, as I traveled all over the state um, right. taking on cases. I then decided to run for the Court of Criminal Appeals and I became the first woman elected to the Court of Criminal Appeals in 1994. I ran again for another six year term in 2000. That year I was the only Democrat who ran statewide and was successful in that particular year and I earned another term. That 12 years on the Court of Criminal Appeals I ruled on over 25,000 criminal cases. Wow. Gosh. So um, that's experience that you know you can't, uh, not everyone can accumulate. So at that time, I, I really believed that the Supreme Court needed trial court experience, needed the depth and breadth of experience that I had, and I ran and became, uh, with the support of so many, I ran against a wonderful man from here in Birmingham. He was fabulous, but I was able to win and because of the, the support of so many, and became the first female Chief Justice in the state, in the history of the state. And I, as I mentioned, I am most proud of the fact that, as far as we know, I'm the only juvenile judge who ever has served as Chief Justice and it really is those cases even though I did a little bit of everything mm -hmm. uh, it's those juvenile cases where you really do see the opportunity to make a difference and turn a life around uh, and hopefully the Lord will give you the wisdom to do the right thing in right. each particular case so that you can put a child on a path for success. Mm -hmm. For you when did you you think I mean wh where you have ended up when, where did that begin? Do you remember when you thought, you know, maybe kind of had dreams of, of a life that you, you ended when up having? When I was in law school, uh, when I was in law school, the district judgeship in Conecuh County became open. 
there was a vacancy. And judges were appointed by the Chief Justice at the time to come and fill in, you know, and the dockets were not very much. Conecuh County is a smaller county. Um, but at that time, I didn't have any idea that I'd be a judge. I was in law school. I did feel a call to go back to Evergreen, go back to my hometown of Conecuh County and serve the people that I love, uh, my hometown. Uh, mm -hmm. who, who, that's the reason I am who I am, are the people of Conecuh County and Evergreen and my wonderful parents and my family. So I, I, I then realized when I was a senior in law school that the vacancy was still there. It was actually like it had just stayed open for me the entire time, because you have to be a resident of the county and you have to have a law degree. Um, the judicial article did away with non-lawyer judges, thank goodness. There's other states still, even the state of New York, who still has justices of the peace that aren't lawyers. Really? Making important decisions over people's lives that don't have law degrees. There are numbers of states out in uh, the West that still have non-lawyer judges. But we did away with that when the judicial article was passed, thanks to Howell Heflin. Um, so I then started you know, contacting the governor, had people say, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm thankful that I had led the kind of life that the people in Evergreen, you know, had wanted me to come back home. I know I was young, um, but they had wanted me to come back home and serve. Mm -hmm. So I had overwhelming support for the appointment, which was very gratifying. Yeah, You had used the term uh, earlier, talking stroke of genius and the, the, the framers of our Constitution. Mm -hmm. and. Um, recently, my daughter was in a choir that sang in the inauguration with uh, the, the recent presidential inauguration. While in town to see her, uh, um, went to the museums and, and you know those great tours and, and seeing those young people mm -hmm. just you know kind of pressing their yeah. faces up to see yeah. the Constitution. When you, as a, as a public servant and, and a historian, look at that. Are you amazed at the wisdom and the foresight of the framers of our country and constitution? It is absolutely amazing that they could be so phenomenally brilliant to have crafted a what we call it as a really a living, breathing document, mm -hmm. that it has it stood the test of time. And other constitutions throughout the world are based on our constitution. They can't quite get it, many of them as wonderful as ours, mm -hmm. but they really are based on our constitution. I, I was speaking at an international constitutional law conference in Brazil. We went to see the mayor of Sao Paulo, the second largest city in the, United, in the world. Um, like 20 million people wow. just in that city. Right. And he began to do basically an expose on our Constitution. I mean, it was so heartening. Uh, they knew more about our Constitution than many of us citizens do in the United States. They revere our Constitution. And, and I'm very proud of the fact that when every judge in the state of Alabama and the President of the United States, from every elected official, we swear an oath to uphold the Constitution of our state and the Constitution of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And that is our job. Uh, and that means sometimes you're going to do things that you really you don't want to do. Um, you reverse cases. When I was a court of criminal appeals judge, I reversed cases that if I'd had my druthers, I probably wouldn't have reversed. But the mm -hmm. law required it. Yeah. The Constitution required it. And when I speak as Chief Justice and really as an appellate judge in the judicial building for 16 and a half years, lots of students, we had lots of tours, and I couldn't see them all by any stretch, but I would try to see and speak to some. And I would ask the kids, uh, and their parents would be in the audience, I'd say, now we reverse cases, criminal cases, and people who are charged with criminal offenses, a lot of folks think are guilty, those cases are reversed. What do, why do we do that? And they would say, because of the Constitution. I said, that's exactly right. Parents may say it was a technicality, but the technicality <laughs> was based on the Constitution. Yeah. Wow. Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing how much uh, you know about the Constitution and how we got to where we are today. You know, a lot of people say you don't know where you're going until you know where you came from, and this helps a lot. And so we've talked about the Constitution and what it is today, but what about how we get uh, our officials now that are to be enforcing the Constitution? and upholding the laws of the United States. How, how does the election process work? There a lot, you will hear criticism, as I have, I, I assume you have, about why federal judges are appointed for a lifetime. Have y'all ever heard, you know, oh, federal judges are appointed for a lifetime, that's mm -hmm. terrible. Yeah, I've heard that. But I, there again, you know, there was the, the insight, the wisdom of seeing that we need judges who can enforce the law 
regardless of any political consequences. Mm -hmm. And that's what your lifetime appointments, whether you like it or not, yeah. they really are insulated from any politics. Once they're there, they're there, and they're insulated from politics. There again, I think you see that the law is so important. We are not a country of men and women. We are a country of laws. And it's supposed to be the same. It's equal justice under the law, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter where you're from. Do you understand the Electoral College? Somewhat. Be because if so, <laughs> if so, after the break, I want you to explain it to I'll us. I'll say, does anyone? Right. <laughs> That's a good question. We'll give that a shot. Former Su <laughs> Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Sue Bell Cobb here uh, on the attorneys. After this break, um, we'll continue our conversation. As we head to break, get your questions to us. We'd love to hear from you. Stay tuned. More attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright and Couch, and thank you for watching The Attorneys on Alabama's 13. Now, we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never need legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of this show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Now, your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to this show or related to other civil legal matters, call, email, or text us to talk with one of our lawyers. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter to learn about important legal news that could affect you or your family. Or simply contact us by going to alabamas13.com and click on the attorney's link. Now we know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and for watching the attorneys here on Alabama's 13. Welcome back in to the attorneys. Appreciate you spending your Sunday evening with us. Um, still time for you to get your questions into us. You can call, text, email those into us. Continuing our conversation with uh, former Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Sue Bell Cobb, Mallory Schneider with the firm uh, Hollis Wright and Couch leading this conversation. <laughs> All right, we're going to get to the, a big issue here, right? Yes, a very big, we're going to understand it. confusing issue. I'm going to take notes. Um, everybody's heard of the Electoral College. Right. Just because you hear that word every time a president is right. elected, uh, you see the counts on there. But what does it mean? What is this enigma of a college? Where did it come from and what does it do? It's probably one of the concepts within the Constitution that perhaps we now, because of technology, probably have outgrown. But when the Constitution was drafted, and when we they first uh, the framers of the Constitution first set out how our president and senators and congressmen and everyone should be elected, they didn't have uh, you know there's no technology, so they literally had to elect people in each state that then would travel to Washington D.C. to cast the votes. Uh, because of that, if there was a tie or whatever, I mean, because they were there and doing that, it, that's why the elect Electoral College made sense. So the numbers literally were the total of their two U.S. Senators per state plus the number of m members in Congress or the House of Representatives based on population. Um, now, however, as we've seen in the most recent election, there's a, because many states have a winner-take-all, which includes Alabama, we have a winner-take-all um, in our, our state law. Oftentimes you'll see a difference between the popular vote and the electoral college votes. Um, the president won by, I don't remember how many points it was this time, but yet he had a large margin in the electoral college because mm -hmm. of that winner take off. Okay. And what happens if there is no winner of the electoral college? It goes to the, it to goes to house? Congress and I think it's to the House, I think. Put I think you on the spot, is. didn't it? Yes. Yeah. I, I should have brushed, brushed up on that. It's very uh, complicated. Yeah. It, and they decide. So I'm pretty sure it's the House of Representatives yeah. that they make the decision. Because, mm. I mean, recent, you know, um, elections, very, very it, narrow it, margins. It has been. Yeah. It um, has been. And so uh, a lot of thought. You think we'll ever do away with the Electoral College? You would think, honestly, I think we will. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really would think so. It's just that we have a resistance to changing our constitution <laughs> yeah. because we have so few um, amendments. I mean, and it would be 
I can see that there's a possibility that it would be changed because people really be, think you have democracy, you think popular vote. You know, that elections should be determined by popular vote. Right, yeah. Certainly um, uh, up for debate because a lot of yeah. folks are uh, talking about it. You're a former judge. Let's talk a little bit about how judges are selected and elected in Alabama. I have a real, um, it's just real consternation about how judges are, are elected in Alabama. Alabama has the most expensive judicial elections in the United States of America. When I won in 2006, I won uh, in the most expensive judicial race in the entire United States of America, the second most expensive race in the history of the United States of America as far as judge races go. Um, but the other states, they don't keep, they're not even anywhere close. Uh, during three election cycles in Alabama, $30 million was spent to elect your state trial court judge, uh, state appellate judges, 30 million. State, you know, your state appellate Evans. judges. Wow. During those three election cycles, the state of California that has merit selection, and many other states, I'm just using California as an example, merit selection, which they have voter retention, and every four years you vote for every judge to decide to keep them or get rid of them, mm -hmm. which means you get to vote on everybody, um, every judge, $230,000 was spent. 30 million, 230,000 in a state with eight times the population. Wow. So it, it's just our races here, um, or it's who can raise the most money rather than who is the most qualified, and it needs to be changed. Because to be perfectly frank, it's very hard for the public. When you ask the public, and these studies have gone nationwide, when you ask the public, do you believe that a judge should be just like a normal politician? They overwhelmingly say no. Mm -hmm. You know, most of them say they shouldn't be attached to a party, which I agree totally. I think judges, I don't make decisions based on my party. I make mm -hmm. a decision based on the law and the facts and what it dictates at that particular time. But the, the other issue, you know, is I had to raise 2.6 million. My opponent raised 5.5 million. How do you convince people that you're not going to make decisions based on your campaign contributions? Mm -hmm. How do you, how can you convince people of that? And it causes a lack of trust. And the only thing the courts have, we have one thing, and that, as as um, former Justice Thurgood Marshall said, the only power that we can tap is the respect of the people. And when we lose people's respect then we lose everything as far as a court system. Because when we make, we have an order, Mallory, it's literally, it's like a piece of paper. We have to make it worth something. And it's worth something by the fact that people respect it. And you talked a little bit about elections and being associated with a party. Obviously, it makes it more difficult in states where they lean more to the right or more to the left for that other party to be kind of left in the dust as far as you know raising money. Do some states have nonpartisan elections where yes. they still elect? But there, there are only seven states in the United States that does does it like Alabama does it. I mean, there's only seven. There's about 21 or 23, I'm not exactly, um, that have nonpartisan elections, and the rest have have uh, systems where they have basically merit selection and um, voter retention. It's called the Missouri Plan. Missouri um, brought it about in the 40s, and there's usually a bill every legislature um, legislative session in Missouri to change the Missouri Plan. They even have people now from out of state that'll come in and put lots of money to try to change the Missouri Plan to get away from merit selected judges who, who you know, each election are their their continuance on the right. bench is determined by a retention vote, mm -hmm. just a yes or no vote. Yeah. All right, time for our uh, second final break of the evening. Uh, one more segment remaining with former Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Sue Bell Cobb. We'll talk with her some more coming up after this quick break. As we head to break, a reminder of how you can get in touch with us in the firm of Hollis Wright and Couch. Um, Mallory, y'all make it easy to find you, don't you? Oh, yeah. You there's, there's, mul there's multiple options That's that right. you see on the screen right Whatever there. Whatever you like. We're, we're at one of those. That's right. <laughs> Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Steve Couch with the law firm of Hollis Wright & Couch. You know, when you serve on a jury, you might expect to have all the evidence presented to you during the case. But there are some forms of evidence that are simply not allowed in court. 
In tonight's Legal 411, we're answering the question, why can't jurors see police reports? Most jurors would like to see police reports during a trial, especially since these documents almost always show the investigating officer's opinion on who is at fault for the crash. Unfortunately, Alabama law prohibits the introduction of such reports into evidence. Alabama law states that no such accident report shall be used as evidence in any trial, civil or criminal, arising out of an accident. According to the lawmakers who wrote and approved this rule, the reason accident reports cannot be admitted as evidence is that a jury might place too much weight on an official document such as a police report. There are some exceptions to this rule, of course, but most courts generally won't allow this type of evidence to be shown to a jury. Despite this rule, police officers who investigate crashes are still allowed to testify. They can tell a jury what they saw at the scene of the crash, including road conditions, the positions of automobiles. An officer can also inform a jury of most any statement the people involved in the crash may have said to the officer during the investigation. The accident report can even be used to refresh an officer's memory of the crash, but the actual document itself that cannot be introduced into evidence, and the officer's opinion of who's at fault is also excluded. That's because a jury is charged with deciding fault based on all the facts presented to them during the trial. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright and Couch want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching the attorneys on Alabama's 13. Welcome back in to the attorneys, our final segment with uh, former Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Sue Bell Cobb. The final segment, but still time for you to get your questions into us. You can call, text, email those to us. Yes, and you know, we have talked a lot about how judges are elected in mm -hmm. Alabama. And what we learned is that they're all elected and they run a bipartisan campaign. Now, why is it that some judges are appointed versus elected here in Alabama? Of course, the federal judges are appointed. They're appointed by the president. Um, the magistrate judges are appointed by the federal judges. But in state court, all judges are elected. The only time they're appointed is to fill a vacancy. Now, even at filling a vacancy, uh, I, when I was Chief Justice, one of the bills that we supported and pushed was um, merit selection upon vacancy. And literally was a bill that, that, that would mandate that any time that there's a vacancy that the, the governor pick based on merit selection. And we could not even get that passed. They wanted, you know, they wanted the, the Republican majority, you know, wanted uh, partisan elections, period. Um, I, that disappoints me greatly because judges, you know, we don't make a decision, like I said, based on party. I mean, it's based on the law. So um, the appointment is by the governor, by our constitution. And so then once they, they appoint, uh, the governor appoints, he does so in most of the counties just who he wants. Now there's about 14 counties, and I may be off a county or two, because each ses session another one will be added, that they have themselves passed a local uh, law, like Jefferson County, um, that puts in a judicial selection committee. And so uh, Judge Scott Vowell, who is the presiding judge, now it's Judge Houston Brown, is chair of the Judicial Selection Committee for Jefferson County. It has, a, it has private citizens, it has lawyers, it has everyone on it. And then any lawyer that's interested in filling a vacancy of a district or a circuit court position uh, in Jefferson County or the state, they would, I mean, in Jefferson County, they would appeal or they would apply to the Judicial Merit Selection Committee. And based on that, they would then offer three names to the governor. The governor would then select one of those three people. The governor can reject um, and then ask again, but if, if they, he does not pick, then the Chief Justice gets to pick, which in some states is how it is. You know, it's the judicial branch. It ought to be the Chief Justice picking. Who would know better who would be the most qualified judges than the Chief Justice. So if we couldn't change anything, I mean, it'd be wonderful to change it to where the judicial branch picks uh, the 
the individuals that would fill those vacancies. How hopeful are you for that change in the state of Alabama? I'm not holding my breath. Not at all. We tried to get just partisan elections, just taking the party labels off and couldn't get that either. Uh, Representative Jeff McLaughlin from Marshall County tried several years to get nonpartisan elections. It would have so dramatically reduced the amount of money because it's, it's immoral, it's obscene the amount of money in Alabama's ju state judicial races. Mm. Why do you think the efforts have been so unsuccessful at this point? What is it about it that seems so bad to everyone else? I, I don't understand it because we're in the minority. There are only seven states that still have partisan election of judges, but the legislature, um, I'll have to say in defense of the Republicans who are in charge now uh, in both houses, when the Democrats were in charge, they had an opportunity to change to nonpartisan elections and they refused to do so. So, um, so it's been both parties at different times. But, you know, I'm just convinced that people are sick and tired of party politics. I mean, they actually want elected officials that will get up there and be problem solvers and actually put politics aside. Let's just do something different. Let's just do something just because it's right. You know, just because it's in the public's best interest, mm -hmm. the citizen's best interest. And that's surely what we want of judges, you know, or individuals that they're sworn to simply do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And I think maybe one thing our viewers would like to know is what's an example of how politics could influence a judge, hypothetically, in, in a courtroom situation? Well, if, first of all, anybody can run. And you actually, and we end up with, unfortunately, judges who are not qualified. Uh, and in very high, um, in ju jurisdictions like Jefferson County, for instance, where you've got such a high number of cases, a large number of cases, you've got, you need qualified lawyers to become judges. Right. Now, I'm actually like the textbook case, you know, because I began brand new right out of law school, but that wouldn't happen today. Uh, because we've now, I supported a practice requirement that said that for every judge now, nobody could do what I did back in 1981 when nobody wanted the job Ooh, anyway. Pressure's off me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, is that you have to be a three, the law passed and you have to have three years of practice um, before you can be eligible to run for the district court. You have to be five years for the circuit court and I think it's seven years for the appellate court, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. All right. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes remaining. But time enough for a, a final thought from both of you, and uh, first uh, for you. I guess if I, you know, when you talk about elections, uh, obviously elections can bring out the best and the worst in people, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. Uh, and I've certainly had my fair share. I've run five times, and I've been, been very grateful because of so many supporting me and helping me to win five times. But the thing that's most important is that, particularly with judges, is how we treat people when they come to court. I mean, people should be treated with dignity. Mm -hmm. People should be treated the same. People should be treated with patience and kindness because they're not there because they want to be. You right. know, they either made a tremendous horrible mistake mm -hmm. or committed a crime, right. you know, or the victim's family. So, you know, I really want judges to really be inspired to treat people with dignity. Yeah. Real quick. Yes, my, my final thought is record this show, watch it <laughs> over and over and over because this is a great civics lesson, yeah. one that quite frankly I need to learn more about. So I'll be going home tonight re-watching this Check show and, and learning some more about my civics. Yeah, well, it was great to have you here. Thank you, David. It really yes, was great to be here. So much. It was our honor for right. sure and Thank hopefully you. Um, you benefited from it as well. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, again, ways that you can get in touch with the firm of Hollis Wright & Couch, call, text, email, uh, find them on Facebook as well as Twitter, Hollis underscore Wright on Twitter. Uh, you'll find them there. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright & Couch. Car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by Hollis Wright & Couch, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the Hollis Wright & Couch Law Firm and host David Lamb.
Hello and welcome into the attorney. It's going to be a fascinating half hour tonight, so we really appreciate you joining us for the next half hour. Uh, our topic of conversation. Uh, it's kind of a history lesson. It's, we're going to talk about elected officials, how it's done, uh, but also learn about the, some details from a fascinating guest tonight. But as always, you are invited to be a part of this conversation. It's for you. You could call, text, email, however is the easiest way for you to get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. Leading our conversation from the firm of Hollis Wright and Couch is Mallory Schneider. Mallory, good to see you. Good to see you as always, David. It's going to be a fun night, isn't it's it? It's going to be such a fun night yeah. because we have a very, very <laughs> yeah. special special oh, guest nice. with us tonight. You are very special. Former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, Sue Bell Cobb. She was Chief Justice from 2007 till 2011 and before that she served on the Alabama Criminal Court of Appeals and so we're very lucky and honored to have you here to talk about the election process and now her credentials go way past what I just told you. That's just a yeah. sprinkle on the resume for you. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind, just fill us in a little bit about how you became Chief Justice and beyond. Well, Mallory, uh, David, it's so nice to be here. It really is. Um, I, I actually became a judge November the 5th, 1981. Probably a lot of your listeners, folks that actually stay up this late <laughs> at night, uh, weren't even born then. Uh, but I became the first um, the youngest judge in the state of Alabama at the age of 25, Governor Fob James appointed me to a vacancy that had been uh, in the Conecuh County District Court bench for four years. Um, the Alabama's court system had been unified uh, by the genius of Senator How, former Chief Justice and uh, U.S. Senator Howell Heflin. And I was able to get that appointment, and then I had to run immediately thereafter. So I have a lot of stories that I'm known for throughout the state of mm -hmm. dogs that ran after me and, <laughs> and uh, various and sundry things and dog bites, like I said, D A W G dog bites. And, oh, um, but I ran and, and won, and then I ran again in, in um, 1988 for another six year term. That was an interesting race. My father driving the pickup truck, you know, going down the, the <laughs> dirt roads um, because, you know, there was no major media in Connecticut County. Right. You know, it was your little yard signs and some ads in the Evergreen Current, our only newspaper at the time. But then, I, after 13 and a half years, and one of the things I'm most proud of is that during that 13 and a half years, I tried cases. I was appointed by whoever the Chief Justice was at the time in um, over 40 counties, serving as circuit district and one time even probate judge of Lowndes County. And so I got a, such great experience uh, as I traveled all over the state um, right. taking on cases. I then decided to run for the Court of Criminal Appeals and I became the first woman elected to the Court of Criminal Appeals in 1994. I ran again for another six year term in 2000. That year I was the only Democrat who ran statewide and was successful in that particular year and I earned another term. That 12 years on the Court of Criminal Appeals I ruled on over 25,000 criminal cases. Wow. Goodness. So um, that's experience that you know you can't, uh, not everyone can accumulate. So at that time, I, I really believed that the Supreme Court needed trial court experience, needed the depth and breadth of experience that I had, and I ran and became, uh, with the support of so many, I ran against a wonderful man from here in Birmingham. He was fabulous, but I was able to win and because of the, the support of so many and became the first female Chief Justice in the state, in the history of the state. And I, as I mentioned, I am most proud of the fact that, as far as we know, I'm the only 